is that is that the sort of the would that be the functional equivalent of when people describe, you know, fiat money today when they say like, you know, all the uh, the Fed is doing is just creating fiat money and it's not backed? I mean, isn't that essentially the same thing or is that even you know, similar? It's, it's credit money. You see, that's what fiat money really is. It's a credit system. Money is IOUs. Because, you know, the idea of fiat money implies that money should be a commodity. That gold really is money somehow. Um, and that you know, modern governments are just like taking this stuff and saying, I demand you treat it as gold or I'll shoot you, basically. Um, it's, it, that goes back to that whole idea that you have governments, you have markets that are really separate and governments interfere. Now, what's really happening is that if, if money is credit, you need somebody to regulate the system. And in fact, that happens throughout history. This is the really fascinating thing. Okay, so you have the credit systems in Mesopotamia, then you have cash for about a thousand years, then it disappears in the Middle Ages, and then of course cash comes back after 1492. You have this huge influx of gold and silver. People are start, have this idea we shouldn't be in debt to each other. We should really use coins in everyday transactions. You know, it seems almost moral to suddenly not to be in debt, like we feel now. Um, that's the thing that period that ends in 1971, when Nixon goes off the gold standard. So we start entering back into a period of virtual money, which is really credit money. Money's a promise. It's an IOU. And people are still thinking in these antiquated terms. They say, no, it's fiat money that's created by the government. It's not real money. And the idea that real money is a thing. But in fact, the original form of money was virtual money. It's not any more real than anything else. But you need some kind of mechanism to make sure it doesn't go crazy. That's true. And that's the difference. And we haven't figured out how to do that yet. And and you say that w- once we moved into that sort of uh, once we move into periods of virtual credit money, that generally mm-hmm. there are protections for debtors, um, uh, because yes. otherwise uh, too much money would be lent out. People would get too far in debt; they would be default, and then they end up having literally to sell themselves off as slaves. And you go on to say that uh, the the uh, the ancient uh, Greeks would probably perceive Americans today, in some ways, to be slaves, in that they have reached that that point where they're constantly catching Precisely. up. Um, but uh, so. But how is it, what, what has gone so wrong in our economies in this country? And when we look at Europe, uh, the IMF has said, you know, uh, the people who have been lending this money essentially the other day, they're not going to have to take a haircut on these. Uh, they're not going to have to suffer at all in the, in the course of sort of the, this, this huge uh, bailout. They're, they're not going to have to take a haircut. We've seen in this country that um, bankruptcy has become less and less of an option from a legislative perspective for your yeah. average citizen. Uh, uh, it, it's not an option at all if you're talking about student debt. Uh, what has gone so wrong? Well, my analysis in the book is that we we're entering in this new phase of what money is, a new phase of, of, of monetary history, but we're doing it backwards. Um, you know, in periods where you have virtual money, well, money is a credit. It's an IOU. It's recognized to be just a promise. Now, the problem, obviously, is how, what's to stop you from generating the stuff incidentally, you know, how, control how many promises you make, and, and even more importantly, what's to stop people from falling into debt traps, uh, whereby the bulk of the population is effectively enslaved to 1% or 2%, the rich. Um, now, this is the great social nightmare of antiquity. Like people fall so into debt, they'll have to sell their children, they'll have to sell off everything they have, eventually they themselves will be sold off as slaves, working for other people. Um, now, in a way, that's exactly what's happening right now. As, I, as, as you say, you know, if, if Aristotle were here today, you know, he would find the distinction between someone so deep in debt that they're, he's selling himself to work for somebody else, and someone so deep, deep in debt that he's renting himself to work for somebody else is kind of a legalistic distinction at best. But the reason why this is happening, it seems to me, is because in every other period of virtual money, they immediately created some huge institution, often even larger than the government, to protect debtors, um, some great moral authority. So that was like the Jubilee system in ancient uh, Judea. In Mesopotamia, they had divine kings who would just make this slate, slate clean, so get all debts are canceled. In fact, the first word for freedom known in any human language is word for debt cancellation. Uh, everybody's off the hook. Start over, reset. Now, um, in the Middle Ages, they really... It, took a different approach. They said, okay, debt peonage is illegal and lending money at interest is illegal. 
And that was enforced, not again, not so much by states, but by religious institutions, uh, church law, Sharia law, whatever it might have been. Um, now, in every case, though, there was some kind of protection for debtors to make sure this whole thing didn't go crazy and everybody didn't end up getting, becoming enslaved. So it was um, either on the front end or the back end. Either we, either we limit the amount uh, that people can borrow or can be charged in terms of interest, or we have this sort of like um, uh, release valve that is institutionalized. Precisely. Um, and, you know, presumably there's other things we could think of if we started really putting our minds to it. But there has to be something. Now, what do we do this time around? 1971, Nixon goes off the gold standard. Money becomes this free-floating credit instrument. Uh, Quickly, you see plastic emerge. Everybody's doing credit transactions. Uh, you see this credit economy where instead of the sort of social welfare state that existed in the 50s and 60s, and um, everybody's supposed to borrow money, get mortgages, uh, 401ks, microcredit will save the world's poor. Uh, so credit's everywhere. Um, you have the financialization of capital, which used to be that investment money was mostly actually a producing or exchanging things, um, now it's all speculation on money itself. I mean, the vast majority of, of money in the world isn't related to anything anybody's actually doing. It's a speculation on uh, other money. Um, okay, so you have all of this happen at once, but what do they do? Instead of creating something to protect debtors, they create the IMF, which is basically there as an international enforcement mechanism to say no one should ever default. Um, and that sort of sets the st moral standard. And as you say, they're they're um, working on the bankruptcy laws to make that much more difficult. They're um, they eliminated usury laws entirely. It used to be there was some limit on what you could lend. Now there's basically no limit. So you have these um, you know uh, payday loan people who are charging the equivalent of 400 percent a year. Uh, you have to have gone to the mafia to, to get for most periods of history. Um, so, essentially, um, they create these institutions. The SNL does the same thing. You know, uh, they're these huge overarching institutions, just like they used to have, but they're doing it completely backwards. They're making, sh they're protecting creditors against debtors. And the result is a social crisis across the world. It's, it's totally non-viable. And uh, the proof of that is that we've been in one form of debt crisis or another pretty much since 1975 or 78, I would say. Um, so the crisis of the 70s has never really gone away. First, we shoved it off on the third world, and then they managed to squeeze out, and it's coming back on us. And in, and in fact, the, 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 the bailing out of the, the banks, as opposed, and, and in the mechanism which they did it, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, if you bought up all those mortgages and basically just said, mm -hmm. everybody's on par, I'm paying off your principal, and that money filtered back up through the banks, it probably would have had not only the same effect in terms of maintaining the solvency yeah. of the banks, it would have probably made it uh, far more stable. But instead, yeah, but it was far more stable because people would have money to spend, and the economy would have been moving along. The government could collect taxes on that money, and we would have gotten we would have had a lower deficit. It would have been salutary on every level. But instead, they basically again went to the lender to the protect the creditor as opposed to the exactly. debtor. And that's just sheer political power. Um, but it's made possible by this crazy moral discourse. And that's why I wrote the book. It's that insidious moral power of, well, you have to pay her debts. I mean, um, it just seems, how could you possibly suggest that people you know, borrow money and just let them off the hook? That's immoral, you know, what that would encourage immoral behavior. Now, of course, the irony is in 2007, 2008, what we discovered was that everybody doesn't have to pay their debts at all, only the little guys. Um, you know, money is, in fact, a promise. It's an IOU, and like any other promise, it can be renegotiated if circumstances change if you're rich and powerful. And, and that has been the case throughout world history. I, I always say rich people can be incredibly generous, understanding, and forgiving when dealing with each other. It's just when you owe them money that suddenly debt becomes a sacred obligation. And that leads us uh, to uh, the actions we have seen uh, all across the world uh, over this past year um, and uh, the ones that we're seeing today uh, on the West Coast. Um, and, you know, mm -hmm. I, you've been with us for a long time, and I, I don't want to hold you too much longer, and I appreciate it. But I just, um, when, very early on, it's been reported that uh, when the early meetings were happening shortly after uh, Adbusters uh, mm -hmm. announced uh, the occupation, in August, you were down in, in New York, and you were attending, yep. and, and in some ways, instigating the very first General Assemblies. 
How? Um, I yeah. I mean, is that? I mean, that seems yeah. fairly accurate. I mean, that's been reported uh, by Bloomberg yeah. at least, um, and um, uh, you know, we'll link to that on Majority FM. But I'm curious as to the evolution of this, um, how it's gone since that time uh, that y- you were engaging in those organizing activities. Yeah, well, I mean, the very first off, um, it was a very interesting convergence of people, the people who were involved in the anti-cuts um, movement here in New York, which was kind of a top-heavy with these, what we call vertical organizations, like, um, you know, sort of people who put together answer to them. Uh, and one, yeah, my role is actually, I was really just in the right place at the right time. Me and a couple of my friends sort of went to one of these meetings, which was sort of run as a rally and a march, and there was a leadership structure. But it was announced as a General Assembly. I think these guys are basically snookered ad busters who didn't really know who they were. And, you know, we kind of came in and turned it into a... Um, real democratic meeting, and that was the start of everything. We got this idea that counterposing what we have in America is utter corruption, like dressed up as democracy, and what real democracy would be like. So, you know, that was the idea. The thing is, you know, um, New York is a really rough place to organize. Uh, there's 40,000 police here, I think, 39. Um, people say that, like, if the New York City, or an independent country, we would have one of the largest armies in the world, just in the cops. So, so it's really rough. Um, and I was really worried at the time, mainly that these guys would just get clobbered instantly, and no one would ever know. And these are always really wonderful young people, very energetic. They didn't really have a lot of experience because they're only doing it for a few years. Um, but you know, so so to be perfectly honest, the idea that this was going to spread instantly across the country and the world. I mean, obviously, you always dream, but like it wasn't the, uh, we didn't really expect it. So, so the first thing that happened, you know, was we seemed to have seized a moment that we, that whereby everybody's waiting for something to happen. And, the, and that moment of defiance, of we're not even going to make demands of you because you're inherently illegitimate. The idea of seizing public space because we are the public, after all, it's our space. We don't have to ask permission. That, that defiant tone is exactly what I think people were looking for. And that's why it just spread instantly to pretty much every community across the United States. So that was very exciting. Now, of course, the government struck back and struck back in this way, which reveals what it really is. And, what, of course, that's what Gandhian strategies work. This is extremely explicitly nonviolent. We weren't even doing property destruction, um, which is important to Bear in mind, because you know, people organize this were anarchists. It's not like anarchists are people who just always break things. Um, and ha- the idea is to demonstrate to people, like, if you challenge authority, it doesn't matter how nice you are. It doesn't matter how nonviolent you are. They will respond to violence, because violence is essentially what they are. Um, they are enforcing a regime that can only be enforced through continual violence. And you can just provide a handy illustration of that, and that's what we've just seen. So I think, you know, the moment we're at is a moment of challenging Americans to think about what kind of country they're really in. All right. Well, uh, David uh, Graber, thank you so much for joining us. Author of Debt, The First 5,000 Years, anthropologist uh, teaching at the University of London. Uh, thanks again for taking the time with us. I really appreciate it. Uh, well, just a fascinating book. And uh, 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 looking forward to reading it a second time. All right. Well, that's a wonderful compliment. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for joining us.